Well, welcome everyone to our weekday text gathering. Today is day 157 in the Circles Reading Calendar, and we are studying chapter 12, section 4, Answering Outrageous Requests. This is a short section, only five paragraphs, but it's another one of the course's extraordinary reframes, and it continues in the spirit of the discussions that we have been having throughout this chapter on why we attack and how to respond to attack. Before I uh, begin, though, I just want to reiterate what I was just saying before I hit record, that um, Robert and I truly appreciate you being here with us each day. It is an honor to gather with you and to go through the text in this way together. So many of you show up here faithfully every day, and I feel like we will look back on this time together and say that we really did make the best of a challenging time together. So I, I, I just wanted to, I woke up with such gratitude for all of you today. And so I just wanted to share it with you. As for announcements, we are beginning our mid-year course companions launch on Sunday. And so those of you who are on the circles mailing list, which I assume is all of you, will be receiving a lot of information about course companions over the next few weeks. And I, I may find a way for those of you who are already in the program to opt out of all of that correspondence, but uh, it does begin with a series from Robert on how we can apply course teachings to, to challenging times. So all of that will kick off next week and I hope that you'll be on the lookout for it. We also are going to release a new Course in Miracles shorts today. We are on page two of Helen's notebooks and Jesus has a, a interesting teaching on uh, embarrassment and why it's a form of fear. Robert, That's right today. We're gonna That's release today. it today. Oh, yeah. great, wow. Yeah, so on the lookout, be on the lookout for that. And that is it for the announcements. So we will move into the prayer. As you know, if you were here yesterday, I am moving into a place where I am, uh, we are praying together. We're teaching you a prayer from the workbook. And this is from lesson 232. Robert has reminded me to get the title of it right. Uh, <laughs> It's be in my mind, my father, through the day. Yesterday, about five times, I said, be in my mind, my father, throughout the day. It is through the day. I have it highlighted and underlined so that I get it right this time. But it is an extraordinary prayer. It is how I start my meditation every morning. And so um, if you have your book, you are welcome to open to page 232. And if you do not, you are invited to close your eyes. Take a deep breath with me. And let's pray. Be in my mind, my Father, when I awake, and shine on me throughout the day today. Let every minute be a time in which I dwell with you, and let me not forget my hourly thanksgiving that you have remained with me and always will be there to hear my call to you and answer me. As evening comes, let all my thoughts be still of you and of your love. And let me sleep sure of my safety, certain of your care, and happily aware I am your son. Amen. Amen. Okay, I guess it's over to me. Yes, let me find you. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, I gotta give you back the hostness, right? What a great section today. Oh, this is such a powerful section. We really should be spending a lot more time with it. I, I was trying to boil it down and it, I didn't boil it down very far. So we have a lot to cover here. And uh, in addition to that, it's going to be controversial. It's going to bring up stuff for us. Uh, and before we can deal with all that, we're gonna have to sign off and leave you to it. <laughs> okay, so I just think this is such 
it's such an amazing section. I've written about this, taught classes on it many times over the years, had people um, carry it out and then write back with what their results were. It's just a great section. Okay. So rather than doing an exercise at the end, what I'd like to, to do is in essence, make the whole thing an exercise by applying all that we're talking about to a situation in our lives. So to do that, we've got to pick the situation first and then we can keep applying everything to it. Okay. So think of a recent, if you can, an ideally current situation in which someone is insisting on you doing something that you don't want to do. So a recent and ideally current situation in which someone is insisting on you doing something that you don't want to do. Okay, for those who are married or living with someone, obviously you've got like 10 things to pick from. Um, if you don't have any situations like this, great, we're so happy for you. Um, <clears throat> but if you do, narrow it down to one if you can, because we're going to be applying everything to that one. And I feel like if you keep it fuzzy, like if, if you kind of have three going on, it might just water things down. So I really encourage you to pick one. From experience, I know half of you are gonna to wanna to pick two or three, but please do one. Okay, and what I want to do now is take you through a sequence. I've tried to sort of shake out this section uh, into a logical sequence. And while I do that, Everything we're talking about, please apply to your situation. Okay? So, to begin with, what you invest in is what you think will bring you salvation. This is kind of an umbrella concept for the whole discussion. Anything you're really invested in is something you think will bring you salvation. Salvation, you know, broadly defined. I'm not gonna do a lot of quoting here because when I started plugging in quotes underneath all the categories, the whole thing got really long and I think we'd kind of lose the thread in all the verbiage. So it's as spare as I could make it. Okay, another framing concept. The poor are merely those who have invested wrongly. This section is based on a pretty dramatic redefinition of what poverty is. Poverty comes from, so it's those who've invested wrongly. If you think about if you invest all your money in stock that ends up being worthless, then you're poor, right? Poverty comes from investing in the world. Now, what, what Jesus is saying is that we've invested in the world, and that means invested in the world's happenings, and because the world is ultimately worthless, all these forms are really just nothingness in the fog. We've all like, it's like we've invested all of our money in a company whose stock became worthless or was really worthless. And who of us hasn't done that? Everyone's invested in the happenings of the world, the happenings of their lives, the things that happen to them. We are all invested. I don't care how spiritual you are, you're invested. So from his standpoint, all of us are poor. Okay, the people we call poor are poor. The people we call rich are poor. All of us. Okay, now to get specific. And again, think about your situation. If a brother insists on you doing something you don't want to do, he has invested in the world and is poor. So the person who's insisting that you picked, insisting you do something you don't wanna do, that person has obviously invested in the world. Um, Jesus says that insistence means investment. You insist on something you're invested in. So if he's insisted on something that you do this thing, 
he has invested in the world and he's poor. He's thus in a state of need. So think about that. This person's investment in this precise happening that you're supposed to provide is a sign that he's invested in the world, in a company that stock is worthless, and he's poor. He's therefore in a state of need. Can you see that in your situation? That whole sequence, invested in the world, there's really nothing of value there, therefore is poor as in, and is in a state of need. Are you thinking about this person as poor and in a state of need? This is a variation on the whole call for help concept, by the way. In fact, I really see this section as the concept of attack as a call for help kind of in action. So let's go from the other person to you. Quote, if you insist on refusing and experience a quick response of opposition, now who of us has not been in that situation, right? And you think, hey, I value myself. I'm standing up for myself. Jesus says, well, actually, you too have invested in the world. You too are poor. So can you apply that to your situation? You're invested in the happenings, or you wouldn't be saying, no, I won't do that. Um, and that means you've invested all your money in a company whose stock is worthless. That means you too are poor. And can you see your own sense of inner poverty, perhaps as a result of that investment? The investment in things have to go a certain way. Has that made you poor? Okay, now the results of your refusal. By refusing, you are overlooking his need and further impoverishing him. I've got a couple of quotes here. If you had not invested as they had, it would never occur to you to overlook their need. When we feel under attack, we forget the other person is in need, right? They're just a threat and they're in a place of strength. So that other person is in need and we're overlooking that with our refusal, aren't we? You, you can't argue that we're not. The next quote's such a great quote. Remember that those who attack are poor. Their poverty asks for gifts, not for further impoverishment. So can you see that you've been further or that you have further impoverished this person with your quick, firm refusal? And I invite you to go ahead and close your eyes now and let's apply that last quote to this person. So repeat in your mind after me, thinking of this person. Remember that those who attack are poor. Their poverty asks for gifts, not for further impoverishment. Okay, it's a different way to look at things, isn't it? Now, what about you? By refusing, you are also joining him in poverty. You are impoverishing yourself. Now, I don't have the quotes here, but this is one of the main themes in the section. It's mentioned about three times. So could it be that in your refusal, rather than this is an act of value, valuing yourself, that you're joining this person in poverty, that you're impoverishing yourself. And can you feel that sense of impoverishing yourself 
as a result of your refusal. We start out by talking about investment is related to your concept of salvation. You invest in what you think will give you salvation. Well, according to this section, both of you are trying to save your ego through attack. That's the concept of salvation that's guiding you both. Okay, so can you see that other person in there insisting that you do this thing is trying to save their ego through attack? Probably not that hard to see. Can you see that you in your firm knee-jerk refusal are trying to save your ego through attack. And if you can, that means you're both doing the same thing, right? Now, in our mind, that's not the case. We aren't doing the same thing. The other person has come to us with this, as the section's going to say, this outrageous request insisted, you know, irrationally that we do it. We didn't do any of that. We just said no to something outrageous. Maybe though, that's not right. Maybe we are doing the exact same thing. We're both thinking that salvation means saving our ego through attack, doing the exact same thing. Okay, so what's the right path here? Instead, you need to sell your investment in the happenings of the world, right? Get rid of that stock by recognizing that the thing your brother insists that you do doesn't matter. If it matters so much, that means these happenings are so important. They're everything. Nothing more than them. They're the sum total of life. Well, that is the wrong investment that has made us poor. Let's sell that investment. Let's think, you know what? It just doesn't matter, this stuff. Whether I take the trash out right now or not, you know, and we all have our various examples. Um, maybe it just doesn't matter that much. Maybe what all these happenings and the details of these happenings are not such a big deal. And then we have the, the most well-known line from this section, recognize what does not matter. And if they ask you for something quote outrageous, do it because it does not matter. Now we're going to see, I know that as soon as I finish talking, we're gonna have all these like exceptions and like, what about this and what about that? We're going to see that Jesus doesn't see this as an ironclad rule. Okay, there are exceptions to this. If someone insists that you stand in front of a speeding car, you're probably not going to want to apply this section. Um, so it's not an ironclad rule. But, but what we'll want to do is we'll want to find exceptions until we just wipe away the whole thing and the section becomes like purposeless. Um, you know, one time in a hundred maybe does it apply. Well, I think it applies a lot more than that. There's a lot of situations where it's just the principle of the matter. It's just our pride. It's just the statement we would make if we did it. Um, and it's the statement we need to make by not doing it. There's so many situations where it really does apply. Okay, so can you imagine that if you really recognized what doesn't matter here, you could just go ahead and do it because this thing just doesn't matter. Can you imagine? By doing it, you fill your brother's need on two levels. Remember, it's the, first, the, the first priority here is he is poor, he's in need. And you fill his need in two ways. First, you show him an example of someone who is not invested in a worthless world and has instead found real treasure. Can't we think that we've heard spiritual stories of you know, spiritual masters, you probably Zen masters who like 
comply with something dumb and thereby show that their treasure lies elsewhere. We've heard those stories, right? Second, you fill his need because out of your treasure, you then give him love in a form he can understand. Right? He thinks this is salvation. So why not just say, oh, you think it's salvation here? I love you. Go ahead. Here it is. So can you imagine that showing your brother an example of someone who's not invested in a worthless world and has instead found real treasure would benefit him? Maybe not in that moment. Maybe it would kind of sit somewhere in his mind for a while before he got that that was a gift, just that example. And can you imagine that it would show him love because it's giving him the thing that he thinks is so valuable? That's a form of love. Okay, according to this section, you don't perceive his request as outrageous. Now, one thing we'll probably want to do is say, okay, I'll do it, but it's so outrageous, right? Um, he, Jesus is saying, if it doesn't actually matter, then it can't be outrageous. So you, and you don't see it as a request being asked of you, but a request that is for you. And I think that is an absolutely brilliant way to turn around our perception of requests we think, oh, request is being made of me, right? I'm supposed to like give out from myself to this other person. He's saying, no, this request is for you. It's for your benefit. So can you look at the request and A, see it as not being outrageous because it doesn't matter? And B, can you think this request is actually for me. That is a real turn, isn't it? The request is actually this specific, nutty, crazy request, so, so we think, is actually for you. And you have found salvation of your mind, not salvation of your ego, salvation of your mind by offering peace. So we thought we save our ego through attack. Jesus is saying through this other way, you, you save your mind by offering peace. And your brother has found the same. Okay, before we discuss so that's the exercise and that's the teaching all at once. Before we discuss, um, this is all in the wrong point size. Anyway, forgive me for that. Um, there's a caveat that comes uh, four chapters later. We once said that if a brother asks a foolish thing of you to do it, but be certain that this does not mean if to do a foolish thing that would hurt either him or you for what would hurt one will hurt the other. So this is a definite qualifier. And in the context, the foolish thing that your brother asks of you that would hurt either him or you is when he comes to you and says, would you please empathize with me by joining in blame of this person who's causing me so much grief? That's an outrageous request you should not say yes to. Um, and then we have this counterpoint from chapter three, which is a great, like it sounds opposite. Anyone who is unable to leave the requests of others unanswered has not entirely transcended egocentricity. I never gave of myself in this inappropriate way, nor would I ever encourage you to do so. So he's wanting us to be so free of how things go and how we're perceived that we can say yes to an outrageous request and we can say no to other requests that might look legitimate. He wants us to have that kind of freedom. But let's not get into the counterpoint and the caveat so much that we wipe away this section. Okay, so I'm done. Uh, Emily, did you want to, I see you there smiling and I see the wheels turning. 
Yeah, I, I have such a split mind on this section because on one hand, I see the beauty of it. I really do. When you have someone who is attacking in various forms, it, it is it is so is the height of of spiritual response to just see them as impoverished and love them through it. I think that's what Jesus did and and what he's calling us to do in his book. And <laughs> I also empathize with the questions that inevitably come up every single time this section is taught around what do you do um, when you have someone who's in a, a genuinely abusive situation or even as Miguel is saying in the comments, what do you do when you just have somebody who would loves to control and would take these outrageous requests to the extreme and so I, I hear you on the caveat. I don't want to use the caveats to wipe away the purpose of the section, but at the same time, this is one that I, and I know many others struggle with. So what do you have to say to Miguel and others who are thinking, yeah, but. Well, with the, the caveat, no, the, sorry, the, the counterpoint about anyone who is in, unable to leave the request of others unanswered, the context for that's really interesting. Um, Edgar Casey towards the end of his life, the American psychic was being just deluged with requests for readings, sometimes from like dying children. And that's, that was his life. His gift was given him when he prayed to help dying children. Um, and he couldn't answer them all. And therefore he um, tried to answer way too many and he destroyed his health and he died relatively young. Um, and that's the context for that saying. So Jesus is, and Jesus says that part of his need to answer their requests was he thought he was unworthy of the peace of God and could make himself worthy by sacrificing. So what we're being asked to do, I think, is, I think those two things are not so opposite. If we can sell our investment in the world, we don't care that much about these happenings, when the trash goes out, you know, whatever. Um, and we don't see our worth as hinging on us making heroic sacrifices. And we aren't invested in how people, what they think of us, which is obviously huge for all of us. Um, and then we are free to, to give in whatever form is appropriate now in this situation. And maybe it's not, maybe it's, to leave the requests of others unanswered. Yeah, and I, I think uh, Claire, her question encapsulates some of what's going on in the chat. What is the difference between fulfilling an outrageous request because it does not matter and sliding into people pleasing? Yeah, well, and he has that caveat, right? What, what's going to hurt one or the other? Don't, don't do it because that'll hurt both. Um, it doesn't absolve us. It doesn't just become a, if someone asks us, then we do it, right? We, we have to still exercise discernment. We, the Course always wants us to ask for guidance. In fact, it, it says that's what, what Casey did wrong. He didn't ask for guidance about which requests to, to say yes to. So that might be our best, our best guide here. That is the best guide, I think, to go within and ask whether this is a request that you are being called to fulfill or whether this is one that you're being called to politely decline. I think a lot of the flavor of this section is it's, it's those little things in life that someone's really invested in. You know, they want us to do that. And we just think, well, you know, this is an incursion on my personal sovereignty. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. And th it is little. Yeah. And I think that that's a really good additional caveat to make, because I know that, that when you have taught this section before, there's inevitably the question about abusive situations, and that is absolutely not what is being discussed here. So I just want to say that because it does tend to come up too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Donna is asking, could it be myself wanting to do something I don't want to do? Could you apply this lesson in relation to inner conflict? 
I, I, the course is very concerned about inner conflict. Um, it thinks it's a huge factor in all of our minds. We just try to overlook it. But I don't think this section really could translate well to that different context. It's all about the interpersonal and, and our own sense of control and all that. There's a couple of questions in the chat about the end of paragraph two. The question is twofold. First, what is to be saved? And the second, how can it be saved? Can you explain the what and the how there? Yeah, I tried to cover those in my points. We tend to think what's to be saved is our ego. That's why the other person's so insistent and that's why we're so resistant. We're both trying to save our own egos. Um, and in that scenario, how it's to be saved is through attack. Right? When someone says, you gotta do this or else, and we say, no way, man, what's wrong with you? Um, we're both attacking, okay? So um, then later on, he says, well, the real view is what's to be saved is your mind. And how it's to be saved is through peace, not attack. And thinking my mind's to be saved here conjures a different set of priorities up, I think, versus my ego's to be saved here. Trinity says, what about when Satan asked Jesus to renounce God and accept him? That falls under the, one of those caveats, doesn't it? <laughs> that probably is a pretty, pretty safe bet for, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, Kim says, I just did this last night with a client in my financial planning practice on a phone call and had a sleepless night. Felt so bad for being inflexible. Mm. Um, so I, I think we just answered this. So the first question is twofold. First, what is to be saved? And second, how can it be saved? Is the answer in five Paragraph five, sentence one, salvation is for the mind, the what, and attain through peace, the how. Am I understanding that correctly? I feel like you just, yes, yeah. you just answered that. You know, one thing we need to say, I think, is some of the most inspiring and beautiful stories in this world are stories where someone is under attack and they see the attacker as the one in need. They see themselves as secure and, and in touch with treasure and they see their attacker as poor. Those are beautiful. I think we sense an egolessness in those stories that is so inspiring and so nourishing for us. I know, and it says so much about us and, and I am in the same place. So I'm absolutely not judging here, but it says so much about us that when we read something like this, Jesus is calling us to something so beautiful. And all we can think of is like, what about my boundaries? And what about my time? And what about this? <laughs> yeah, and, right. and that is the, the, the story of this section. And, and, and to some extent, the story of the course itself. Yeah, I think that... Um that asking about the exceptions is legitimate. He, there's a reason he comes back four chapters later and says, hey guys, there are exceptions. Um, it's legitimate and it can easily be a case of trying to use exceptions to undermine the whole message here. Yeah, and then there's the other side of doing the request and then chasing your tail, <laughs> doing the, so it's, it's both. But you are. You're I saying know, you're, you can have cascading calling, requests. Yeah, you're, it just gets recursive. Um, okay, so last question for Michael, and then we'll we'll close. Michael says it could be seen that the request to leave your nets and follow, drop your nets and follow me, quit your job, may be seen as outrageous or divine. How can you tell the difference? That is a great question because some things that are divine seem very outrageous. I would know. Uh, we all would know, but. I and some things that seem divine are actually outrageous. <laughs> you know, you hear stories of people getting caught up in cults and, if, and you hear their story and it all makes sense from their standpoint, but you realize something really sinister is going on from the start and they thought it was totally divine. So, you know, I well, guess how, we're, we're just screwed. How can, stop it. How can you, can you tell? I, I think you have to... I think you have to be discerning. You have to learn to look within. Something within you, I think, knows in that moment, and you have to listen to that thing. 
which yeah. often which times we don't want to listen to. And you can also tell when it becomes clear that external circumstances are arranging themselves around that thing that you feel is happening within you too. Yeah. I just, I know we're, we're done time-wise, but I just watched that uh, Netflix documentary on Jeffrey Epstein. Mm. And you hear these heart-rending stories of, of, of girls at the time uh, being offered these amazing rides in life, you know, free education and this and that and the other. And they're thinking, this is so amazing. And surely there was a voice inside them saying, Too good to be true. Mm -hmm. yeah, this doesn't smell right. Mm -hmm. And obviously the ones whose stories we're hearing didn't listen to that little voice. Yeah. And many are saying on the chat, you know, of course, asking for your own guidance and, and yeah, I just think there's something in us that always knows whether something is outrageous or a divine request. So. Yeah. Although in this case, Jesus is basically saying from a normal standpoint, this is probably an outrageous request. It's your job to, to realize that because it doesn't matter, it can't be outrageous. Okay. All right, Robert, thank you as always. And thanks to all of you for joining us as always another great <laughs> gathering and we will see you again on Monday. And if you want to write us with your stories of your results, please do. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yes. Thank you. See you Sunday. Thank you. See you Sunday. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.